am Professor Patrick. Professor. Doctor Professor Patrick. Welcome back, everybody. We're going to move on to the GI section. So the learning objectives here are going to be to appraise common oral ulcers and masses, to interpret common esophageal problems, symptoms, and dysmobilities, indicate the diagnoses and management of epigastric pain or obstipation, contrast presentations and associations of irritable bowel disease, evaluate presentations of acute emergent abdominal pain, manage the patient with GI bleeding, and identify common pathologies of gastrointestinal disease on radiography. So we're going to work through top to bottom and then look at some films. So starting with oral mucosal ulcers, there's a few different causes and we're going to go through over them now. So if you have a 31-year-old woman who presents with painful sore in her mouth, she repeatedly gets these whenever she's under stress and not eating healthy. On exam, there's a single gray-based ulcer on the anterior buccal surface. So the diagnosis here would be an aptus stomatitis or canker sore. It's not well understood, but they can be related to stress, diet, smoking, and certain autoimmune conditions. The treatment is going to be supportive, or if you've got a local pharmacy, they might have a magic mouthwash, which would be a mix of some type of lidocaine um, and some other um, emollients. So next up, we've got a 23-year-old professional baseball player who develops a sore throat and fever. On exam, there are multiple ulcers and vesicles with a gray border on the pharynx, tonsil, soft palate, uvula, and tongue. So this is herpangina. This is caused by Coxsackie virus, A more likely than B, or echovirus, sometimes called hand, foot, and mouth disease. For some reason, a couple years ago, there were a lot of baseball players that were on the disabled list for this, so I threw in that. Um, but this is a common question, and they like to differentiate it between herpatic gingivostomatitis. So look for the lack of fever um, and the gray border on these compared with um, the herpatic gingivostomatitis. So now we've got a 19-year-old college student who presents with fevers, headaches, and painful lesions on the mouth causing difficulty eating and drinking. On exam, there are multiple pinpoint vesicles with ulcers apparent on the gums, cheeks, and lips. So this is going to be your hepatic gingivostomatitis caused by herpes simplex 1. You can treat this one with acyclovir and oral rehydration. And then um, one more point to consider for these, the gingivostomatitis is more in the anterior of the mouth, and herpangina is more in the posterior pharynx. So lastly, we've got a 45-year-old Middle Eastern man who presents with painful ulcers in his oral mucosa, as well as joint pain and vision loss. So the diagnosis here is Bichette syndrome. It's a vasculitis that can present with oral, genital, um, any mucosal ulcers, so the vision loss might be related to that, and you treat that with steroids. Now we've got oral cancers. So we've got a 64-year-old chain smoker who uses chewing tobacco and drinks one pint of vodka per day who presents with an oral lesion. So we're going to describe a lot of these oral lesions and then um, kind of give their diagnosis. So if it were a rough white plaque on the sides of the tongue that's unable to be scraped off, that is leukoplakia. It's a pre-malignant lesion that can develop into squamous cell carcinoma. It's different than oral thrush, which you will be able to scrape off. So if there is a non-healing ulcer in the buccal membrane that's friable and bleeds, that's more likely to be a squamous cell carcinoma. It's associated with tobacco use and distilled alcohol. The treatment's going to be surgery and radiation. If there were multiple purplish plaques in the oropharynx and they have a history of IV drug use, um, think about Kaposi's sarcoma. It's associated with HIV and it's caused by her herpes simplex virus 8 infections in the immunosuppressed. There's also an increased association in Italian men, um, funny enough. So the last one we have here is if there was a bony mass protruding over the midline of the hard palate, this is likely to be a torus palatinus. Um, these are often benign and can often change and become a site of trauma over time for food, tongues, things like that. The next best step is going to be a tissue biopsy in all of these cases except for torus palatinus. Moving into salivary gland masses, if we've got a 58-year-old with Schrogen syndrome who's got pain and swelling of his cheek that's particularly worsened around mealtime, on exam there's halitosis and erythema surrounding the submandibular duct. On submandibular gland is swollen and fluctuant. The diagnosis here would be a sialolithiasis. The treatment you can try sour foods like lemon heads is the classic home remedy for it to promote salivation and expulsion of the stone. 
And then you can consider antibiotics like nafcillin or clindamycin for infection because these are commonly infected by like a staph aureus. Surgery or lithotripsy may be required for larger ones or stubborn stones. So if you've got a 45-year-old man who presents with painless swelling on his left cheek that's increased in size over the past year, he does not smoke, use tobacco, drink alcohol, on exam, there's a one centimeter irregular, painless, soft, mobile mass without fluctuance, and the cranial nerves are intact. So your next best step with any type of cheek mass that's not fluctuant or infected would be to take a fine needle biopsy. And there are benign tumors like pleomorphic adenomas. They tend to recur and can transform to malignant tumors like a Warthrin's tumor in an older individual. Um, malignant tumors like mucoepidermoid carcinomas are linked to CMV and tend to involve the facial nerve. So in this um, vignette, there were a lot of um, benign sounding words here. So painless, soft, mobile mass without fluctuant. And the fact that his cranial nerve is intact, it's not invading his cranial nerve, makes it sound like a pleomorphic adenoma. And the treatment for all of these is going to be surgical removal. Next up is odenophagia. So we've got a 67-year-old woman with osteoporosis and hypertension who wakes up in the morning with this intense pain on swallowing. She takes her medications with a quick swig right before bedtime. So the diagnosis here is pill esophagitis. You want to look at NSAIDs, any potassium-containing pills, tetracyclines, and bisphosphonates as common culprits. And the treatment here is going to be to consume a full glass of water with your pills and remain upright for 30 minutes. Um, pain relievers, sucralfate, um, and talking to your local pharmacy about any lidocaine splotch. So next we've got a 36 year old with HIV who's not previously treated, presents with painful difficulty swallowing. On exam there are white plaques evidence in the oropharynx, so that's going to be your oral thrush. Your next step is going to be treatment with antifungals. So Canada is a common cause of oral thrush as well as esophagitis or adenophagia um, in HIV individuals. The empiric treatment is unsuccessful. You might have to do endoscopy and biopsy to search for CMV or HSV retinitis. So you would see these on endoscopy as linear ulcers um, or extreme ulcerations. The Canada you would see as a um, puffy white flush. Now we've got achalasia. So a 57-year-old woman who presents with difficulty swallowing solids and liquids. She must eat slowly and drink lots of liquid and even walk around the room to prevent having chest pain and regurgitation of her food. So dysphagia to solids is going to be mechanical. Dysphagia to solids and liquids is usually going to be due to motility problems. So your next best step with anyone having difficulty to swallow would be to do a barium swallow study. In this case with achalasia, you want to look for a bird's beak appearance. You can next try an upper endoscopy to rule out cancer as a cause of achalasia or try manometry as the gold standard for the diagnosis. So aperistalsis and failure of the lower esophageal sphincter to relax is going to be pathognomonic for achalasia. Treatment, you can try medical therapy with calcium channel blockers or nitrates this is just to relax that lower esophageal sphincter. You can also do mechanical dilation, but it carries a risk of esophageal perforation and we'll go into perforations later. You can do botulism injections, uh, but they have to be readministered every two years. And you want to monitor these patients for esophageal cancer because there's a 10% lifetime risk within 10 to 25 years after the diagnosis. Now we get into dysphagia. If you can't swallow, here are some of the common causes um, and illness scripts for these patients. So if you have a 28-year-old with a history of asthma and eczema who presents for progressive dysphagia to solids and liquids, Barium swallow study shows multiple narrowings in the esophagus, or a cat's esophagus is what they'll say. Um, you can think of eosinophilic esophagitis. It's associated with food allergies, and the treatment is going to be um, finding out in the diet what is causing this and eliminating it, and then PPIs as well. So now we've got a 57-year-old man who has chest pain and regurgitation whenever he eats steak or pork chops. This is a classic Schatz Schatzky's ring. It's associated with a sliding hiatal hernia, and you can treat this with dilation, surgery, or making sure to chew your food properly. So a 67-year-old man complains of halitosis and regurgitates undigested foods hours after he has eaten. On exam, there's a palpable mass in the left neck. Barium swallow shows a pouch, so he's saving these snacks for later. This is a Zanker's diverticula. It's in the upper one-third. It's a false diverticula, so it does not contain all four um, mucosal layers. 
and it's associated with dysmotility. So um, think of the esophagus contracting on both sides of the food and forcing it into um, the side of the neck and creating a new pocket. You want to treat this with surgery. So now we've got a 24 year old with a history of anemia who presents for dysphagia to solids and liquids. On exam there is a spoon shaped nails and barium swallow shows a web like blockage in the esophagus. So this is a classic plumber vinson syndrome. You want to look for the triad of iron deficiency anemia, upper web um, in the throat area, and then risk of squamous cell carcinoma. So you can treat this with surgery to remove the web and then you want to monitor for the risk of squamous cell carcinoma. So lastly, we've got a 61-year-old woman who has progressive dysphagia to solids. She has a history of rheumatic heart disease and atrial fibrillation. On exam, there's a diastolic rumble heard at the apex. So diastolic rumble at the apex is classic for mitral regurge. And then in this case, we have left atrial enlargement. So anatomically, the left atria is the most posterior and it presses up against on the esophagus if you get left atrial enlargement. So now moving into the esophageal spasms and hiatal hernias. So we've got a 54 year old man who has hypertension and he has crushing chest pain that radiates to his jaw after eating ice cream. Cardiac workup is negative, but he continues to have pain. An upper GI swallow study shows a corkscrew appearance. So the diagnosis here is an esophageal spasm. So you wanna first rule out any cause of chest pain um, that's cardiac in nature in this patient. And then the next best step would be the barium swallow and manometry and you're looking for disorganized and sporadic contractions. A lot of the times these are initiated by cold foods or emotional stress. So the treatment are gonna be nitrates and calcium channel blockers to relax the esophagus. TCAs have also been tried, um, so that's an option. So now we've got a 49 year old man with a history or with a BMI of 43 who presents for worsening GERD despite diet modifications and PPI therapy. His exam is benign. So the diagnosis here is most likely a hiatal hernia, and the next best step is a barium swallow and eventual upper endoscopy to diagnose this. The types of hernias, you have a sliding hernia, which is by far the most common. That's where the gastroesophageal junction and the stomach herniate through the esophageal hiatus, so it can slide up and down in the correct opening. And then you've got a paraesophageal hiatal hernia, which is far less common, but more dangerous because the stomach herniates Without the gastroesophageal um, junction, some of the fundus herniates anywhere in the diaphragm, and this can strangulate. So the treatment is going to be medical management of GERD, which it seems like this patient had already been doing. And then if that fails, you can try a Nissen fundoplication, fund um, which is a surgical repair. And then any paraesophageal hernias require surgery. So now getting into um, the GERD. So we've got a 55-year-old stand-up comedian who experiences burning chest pain multiple times per day. He wakes up with a metallic taste in his mouth, and he's had a dry cough on and off. He notices his symptoms are worse at night and before bed after a late-night pizza, beer, and chocolate. So the next best step here is so the next best step is a trial of antacids. Uh, PPIs are better than H2 blockers, and you would use this for four to eight weeks. Um, the gold standard is going to do pH monitoring, but that's not often done. And then for those who fail to respond to the initial trial, you can do an upper endoscopy to kind of see what's going on. The treatment of choice would be lifestyle and diet modifications. Um, there are risk of using PPIs and H2 blockers long term. So they decrease the absorption of divalent cations, so your calciums and magnesiums. They also increase your risk of osteoporosis. Um, pneumonia and gastrointestinal diseases. So um, Nissen fund application uh, to repair a hiatal hernia can be considered in those who are failing to respond to treatment as well. So undermanaged GERD can lead to Barrett's esophagus, which is a pre-malignant metaplasia, and you want to diagnose and screen this with endoscopy, and you can treat it with radiofrequency ablation or resection, and this is going to prevent the um, transmission of adenocarcinoma from the Barrett's esophagus. Esophageal cancer, speaking of that, we have a 62 year old with long-standing GERD. He was treated with over-the-counter antacids and he, prevents, he presents for progressive dysphagia to solids. He smokes two packs of cigarettes per day and drinks one pint of vodka per day. The next best step here is going to be a barium swallow with all the dysphagias. You wanna look for a partially obstructing or fungating mass within the esophagus.
and then endoscopy and biopsy is going to be the conformational test to determine what type of cancer this is. We'll go over those two types. And then you can do transesophageal ultrasound or CT to further stage this cancer and to determine what treatment. So the types of cancers. Squamous cell carcinoma is much more common in the upper third and it's due to smoking, alcohol, hot teas, HPV or PVS, Plummer Vincent syndrome. And then adenocarcinomas are more common here in the United States um, due to high incidence of white men with GERD and obesity. The treatment for both of these is going to be surgical if it's stage 0 to 2A or palliative chemo radiation if they're 2B to 4. Now we've got the Mallory Weiss tears or Borhov syndrome. So a 24 year old woman comes to the ED after vomiting large amounts of blood. She has a history of bulimia and was reliving her glory days on spring break. She may have had too much to drink as well as ate questionable potato salad left out on the beach. She started retching and vomiting two to three times before her most recent emesis contained bright red blood. So the next best step would be a water-soluble gastrographin study. And this is done in case there's a perforation. Um, the contrast that's used in a barium swallow can irritate that more. So you want to do something wa water-soluble. And then if endoscopy is the next choice for a Mallory Weiss tear, you treat them by giving them nothing by mouth and PPI to allow the partial tear to heal. Um, you can do a chest x-ray and you want to look for air within the mediastinum. On physical exam you can feel that as subcutaneous emphysema or rice krispies in the upper chest. Um, and the gastrographin study to look for contrast that's kind of outside the lumen and that's diagnostic for Borhoff syndrome or a full thickness tear. You would treat that with NPO and antibiotics because there's a 20% mortality with mediastinitis. You want to do PPIs and surgery within 24 hours to relieve that. So now we've got peptic ulcer disease moving down into the stomach and duodenum. So we have a 37-year-old refugee with arthritis who presents for gnawing, aching pain in her stomach that's started and it's worsening this morning. Vital signs show a pulse of 96, BP of 129 over 85, and temperature of 37.2. On exam, there's tenderness in the epigastrium without rebound or guarding. The next best step, if you're thinking PUD, is going to be an upper endoscopy and biopsy. So you can do the staining for H. pylori, and you can also determine if there's any malignant potential of some of these ulcers. So acute bleeds or perforations may require surgery. We're going to go over GI bleeders later this chapter. So the treatment would be to stop any NSAIDs. Number one, smoking and alcohol is also going to decrease the healing. And then um, trial of antacids, a PPI or H2 blocker, along with sucrophate or mesoprostol um, to kind of guard that area of the stomach. You want to treat any H. pylori if it was found on biopsy with triple or quadruple therapy and check for eradication. And then gastric versus peptic ulcers. There's kind of this train of thought that gastric ulcers are worse with food because they're going to be activating you know, your acid production when you're getting ready to eat food. There's also higher complications and malignancy rates. And then peptic ulcers are going to be better with food because your duodenum starts secreting um, bicarb. Um, as soon as you're eating food and it's a higher risk of H. pylori and it's associated more with NSAID use. So now moving into gastric cancers, we've got a 59 year old Japanese man who presents with a one month history or a four month history of abdominal pain, anorexia and weight loss. On exam, multiple lymph nodes are palpated, including the left supracovicular, that's Virchow's node, and periumbilical, the Sister Mary Joseph nodes. So the next best step would be endoscopy and biopsy. And the risk factors here is a diet high in salt and smoked foods with nitrites, um, which is why there's a much increased risk in Japanese men. And then H. pylori is also a large risk factor here. If you've got pernicious anemia or Menetrier's disease, this can also lead over long term to gastric cancers. So the most common type is adenocarcinoma. There's a diffuse type with signet ring cells. And then there's also a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that can present in the stomach, which is related to H. pylori. The treatment for these is going to be surgical resection and chemotherapy. Now, we're going to move into small bowel at this point. So the small bowel obstruction, or SBOs. So we've got a 59-year-old woman with a history of gastric bypass surgery who presents with worsening abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. She has not been able to tolerate anything by mouth without emesis or belching and she's not passed gas or had a bowel movement for 12 hours. 
Vital signs are temperature of 37.4, BP of 112 over 61, and a pulse of 109. Physical exam shows a distended abdomen with tympany and pain in the epigastrium on palp palpation. On auscultation, there is a high-pitched tinkling sound that can be heard. So your next best step is going to be an upright abdominal x-ray. Um, that's the best screening test for this. And you can also consider a CT scan, which is more accurate. And you want to look for dilated loops of small bowel and then the air fluid levels with minimal gas in the colon. And then you can try a barium enema with upper GI series or follow through if that's non-conclusive or if there's a partial obstruction. The cause most commonly is adhesions from previous abdominal surgeries. There can also be incarcerated hernias, malignancies and tussusceptions. Um, Crohn's disease is notorious for this and carcinomatosis or superior mesenteric artery syndrome, especially in a bypass patient. So the treatment would be conservative management with an NG tube placement, IV fluids and potassium supplementation. If this is not responding, um, you can try surgical lysis of adhesions and bowel resection may be necessary if there's any strangulation, if there's complete obstruction or if there's persistent partial obstruction. The problem with surgical lysis is you're going to create more adhesions by doing that, so the risk of small bowel obstruction increases again. So now moving into small bowel enteropathies, we've got an 18-year-old woman with years of abdominal pain, bloating, fatigue, heavy menstrual periods, weight loss, and rash. On exam, there's a papillovesicular rash seen on the extensor surfaces of the arms. So this is a classic celiac sprue disease, um, which is seen with anti-tissue glutaminase, IgAs. You can confirm this with a flattened villi on a small bowel biopsy, and you wanna treat this with a strict gluten-free diet. So um, celiac disease is associated with IgA deficiency, and it's related to the HLA-DQ8. Um, specifically in her presentation, the heavy menstrual periods and weight loss um, are probably due to malabsorption, um, which is a big problem with celiac disease. So next we've got a 34-year-old minister who presents with weight loss, steatorrhea, cramping and bloating since returning from Haiti six months ago on a mission trip. And this is tropical sprue. It's very similar to celiac sprue, but it's thought to be more acquired. You can diagnose this with flattening villi and inflammatory smells on a small bowel biopsy. And you wanna treat this with antibiotics and folic acid. So lastly, we've got a 49-year-old man who presents with one year of weight loss, diarrhea, steatorrhea, joint pain, and hyperpigmentation, which is key. So this is more of a Whipple's disease picture. You can diagnose this with PAS staining for macrophages and the lamina propria, and then non-acid fast gram-positive bacilli. The treatment here is a very long course of antibiotics, sometimes nine months to over a year. Now we're gonna move into IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. And specifically, we're gonna be focusing on the differences between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Um, classically, they're taught as two separate diseases, but in real life, they can be more of a spectrum of disease. So some of the differences that you'll wanna to know to discern these questions are going to be, Crohn's disease is more commonly a non-caseating granuloma with transmural involvement, and then it skips areas, there are skip lesions, and it's classically pictured as cobblestoning appearance, versus your ulcerative colitis Ulcerative colitis is a crypt ulcers, so it's only the mucosa and submucosa, so it's not transmural, so there's no risk of fistulas, and then there are no skip lesions, so classically it's from the rectum, and it goes as far up the colon as it desires, so to speak, um, where Crohn's disease can skip from the rectum anywhere up to the uh, mouth if it feels like it. So next, Crohn's disease, the lesions involve part of the mouth to the anus, but usually the most common area is the terminal ileum. In ulcerative colitis, the lesions are limited to the colon and the rectum is always involved. So the rectum can be involved in Crohn's disease. It should always be involved in ulcerative colitis. So you never wanna do any surgery on a Crohn's disease patient. Um, they have a high risk of fistula formation and poor wound healing. Um, versus surgery can be curative for ulcerative colitis, um, especially due to their risk of colon cancer and primary sclerosing cholangitis. Crohn's disease, there's an increased risk of fistulas, fissures, and perianal involvement as well. And then the classic imaging signs that you can see is a string sign on a barium enema or barium swallow for Crohn's disease, or a lead pipe sign where they lose the haustra within the colon on ulcerative colitis. So some of the extra 
extra intestinal manifestations of IBD in the joints. They can have a monoarticular arthritis. So this is one of those seronegative spondyloarthropathies. Um, they can have sacroiliitis and ankylosing spondylitis. In the eyes, there's an increased risk of anterior uveitis. And on the skin, ulcerative colitis classically is associated with pyogenic gangrenosum, which is a large fungating looking lesion, which is actually aseptic. And then erythema nodosum in Crohn's disease or painful red nodules on the um, shins. And then um, in the blood, there is hypercoagulability and ITPs associated with them. So specifically Crohn's disease, you want to look for a 33-year-old Ashkenazi woman who presents with worsening abdominal pain, diarrhea, and weight loss. There can be mouth sores and rectal abscesses. She's had a history of anemia requiring B12 injections. On exam, there's tenderness in the right lower quadrant, and there's aphthous ulcers and perianal fistulas on exam. So the next best step here would be an endoscopy with biopsy. We need tissue to make this diagnosis, tissue while it's inflamed. Um, and a barium enema or GI series with small bowel follow-throughs can be helpful, although it's less sensitive and specific. The complications, like we said earlier, fistulas, small bowel obstructions because they form these fistulas, B12 deficiency because it commonly affects the terminal ileum where you're going to absorb your B12. There are calcium oxalate nephrolithiasis um, because you decrease the absorption of oxalate, so you're going to excrete more in the urine and then cholelithiasis because you're also decreasing the absorption of bile. So your treatment here is going to be steroids for acute flares and then any type of immunomodulator, azathioprine, 6-mercaptopurine, infliximab, et cetera, um, to try and control management and wean the use of steroids as much as possible. For ulcerative colitis, this is a 22-year-old man who presents with three months of fevers, weight loss, and then urgent small amounts of diarrhea. He's got no travel history, no sick contacts, and no diet alterations have any effect on his stool. Rectal exam reveals fecal occult positive stool in the vault. So bloody diarrhea is the most common presenting finding for UC. The next best step is endoscopy with biopsy, and you want to rule out any infectious organisms with a stool ova and parasite or a C. diff toxin. Complications here include the risk of toxic megacolon, so when it dilates larger than 10 centimeters in the colon, there's a risk of perforation. And then primary sclerosis and cholangitis, there's a high increased risk in those with UC. And then long term, there is, or there is colon cancer risk, so you want to screen with a colonoscopy eight years after diagnosis and yearly thereafter as long as they have a colon. Um, you can decrease the incidence of this with a colectomy. And then treatment is going to be steroids for the acute flares. For mild disease, you can try five ASA compounds like sulfasalazine or misalamine. And then for severe disease, using the immunomodulators like azathioprine, 6 mercaptopurine and fliximab, cyclosporin. And then, like I said before, surgical res resection is an option for UC. Moving into irritable bowel syndrome, not disease. We have a 28-year-old woman who presents with intermittent abdominal pain, bloating, and diarrhea. She has no hematochesia, no nocturnal awakenings, no weight loss or family history of IBD, and her abdominal pain is mostly relieved on defecating. So using the Rome criteria here, we've got a lot of symptoms that are relieved with defecating, and then there's no red flags. There's no hematochesia, nocturnal awakenings, or family history of IBD or cancer. The next best step is to exclude any diagnoses with a physical exam in labs. And then based on your Rome criteria, you need abdominal pain and discomfort for greater than three days per month over the past three months with more than one of the following. Symptoms improve with bowel movements. There's a change in stool frequency or a change in the form of the stool when they're undergoing these symptoms. The treatment is diet and lifestyle modifications. So you want to treat any comorbid depression or anxiety and symptomatic relief of the diarrhea or constipation depending on which type is predominant and the abdominal pain. So there have been studies that show that there is an increased sensitivity to the visceral um, pain felt within the GI tract in those with IBS. So think of this as like an extra sensitive GI. Next, we're moving into the appendix. This little organ has a few things to know. So there's a 47-year-old man with 18 hours of abdominal pain. It's migrated to his right lower quadrant, which is classic. He has had three episodes of emesis in the last hour. He has no abdominal surgical history, so it doesn't sound like an SPO. He's not eaten within the past eight hours. 
Vital signs are BP 118 over 76, heart rate of 105, and a temperature of 38.1. On exam, his abdomen is tender palpation with guarding and McBurney's point, or one-third the distance between the umbilicus and the anterior superior iliac spine. So Rosving, psoas, and obturator signs are all positive, which are special tests to test for an inflamed appendix depending on its positioning. The next best step is going to be to diagnose clinically and prepare for surgery. So an appendectomy, give IV fluids and antibiotics. There are new studies that show conservative management with antibiotics in stable patients can be tried. And then a CT scan is preferred over ultrasound if there's any imaging needed, if there's question within the clinical diagnosis. So still moving on to the appendix, we've got a 55 year old woman who presents with intermittent flushing, diarrhea, and wheezing. On exam, there's a soft diastolic rumble heard over the left sternal border that increases with inspiration. So we've heard that sound before, and that's gonna be a tricuspid stenosis sound, and this is due to carcinoid syndrome. So the most common site for this neuroendocrine tumor is actually the appendix. Um, so it's important during colonoscopies to try to reach the appendix and document that um, to test if there's any neuroendocrine tumors there. Lastly, we've got a 61-year-old woman who presents with three months of periumbilical pain, anorexia, and increasing abdominal girth. A CT scan shows a mental caking. So this is a pseudomyxomus peritonei, or jelly belly. It's a rare mucin tumor that can originate within the appendix. It can also be caused by an ovarian cancer. Um, and these are very difficult to treat. Um, you can try high packs, you can try chemotherapy palliatively, um, but it's very poor prognosis. Now we're moving into the colon. We're gonna start with C. diff, Clostridium difficile. An 87-year-old woman from a nursing home presents with diffuse watery diarrhea and cramping abdominal pain. She was recently treated for pneumonia in the hospital and received antibiotics. Vital signs show a BP of 103 over 65, a temperature of 38.4, and a pulse of 124. On exam, there's hyperactive bowel sounds and tenderness without guarding. So the next best step is abdominal radiograph. You want to rule out toxic megacolon if you're concerned with C. diff. The gold standard for diagnosis is a C. diff PCR of the stool, or you can do a flexible sigmoidoscopy. Although that's rarely performed, you can see the pseudomembranous formations in the colon. Treatment guidelines new in 2018 from McDonald et al. Vancomycin or fidaxomycin are first line that's preferred over metronidazole. They decrease the risk of um, colony formation within the gut. And then vancomycin and metronidazole concurrently if there's severe disease. So if there's leukocytosis greater than 15,000, if their creatinine took a bump over 1.5, or if there is hypotension or toxic megacolon, you want to treat with both. Now we've got diverticulitis and diverticulosis. So we've got a 60-year-old man who presents for a colonoscopy. He's noticed small amounts of bright red blood in his stool, and he eats a classic American diet of meat and potatoes. The results show multiple outpouchings in his sigmoid colon. For treatment, he's told to eat a high-fiber diet or supplement with dilazium. So seven years later, he presents with two days of worsening abdominal pain. In the past six hours, he's had emesis, fevers, and anorexia. He's got no surgical history or sick contacts. Vital signs are BP 128 over 89, a pulse of 97, and a temp of 37.8. On exam, there's guarding in the left lower quadrant. The next best step for him would be a CT scan with oral and IV contrast. And we want to look for any abscess formation, any colobesicular fistulas, or colonic perforations, as this is likely a diverticulitis or inflammation of that colon area, sigmoid. The treatment for uncomplicated is going to be to keep him NPO, give him IV fluids and antibiotics, and then transition him to PO antibiotics for seven to 10 days. Any abscess that you found on CT will need to be drained percutaneously or surgically. And complicated or recurrent episodes require a surgical resection and a Hartman's procedure. So if someone presents with a perforation, you would have to stage them and first do a um, colonic pouch and then try to reconnect after the incident. So acute versus chronic mesenteric ischemia. So we've got a 66-year-old woman with AFib who presents with acute abdominal pain. Her pain began suddenly while at rest one hour ago. She is screaming in pain, even though there is no guarding found on exam. The next best step is a mesenteric angiography. So you want to look for where the clot is um, within the GI vasculature. 
and you want to treat with IV fluids, antibiotics, and removal of the clot, either with heparin or an embolectomy, and then you're going to have to do surgical resection of any infarcted bowels. So this can commonly present as multiple punctate bowel lesions, um, and it's a very difficult surgery. So if you've got a 78-year-old man with a history of diabetes, smoking, hyperlipidemia, and MI, and he's had three stent placements, and he has abdominal pain. The pain is described as aching, and it's associated with eating large meals. He's lost 20 pounds in the last six months, as he describes a fear to eat. That's when he gets this pain. His exam is perfectly benign. Next best step, again, is mesenteric angiography, and the treatment is going to be surgical revascularization. So think of this as the PAD, or the angina of the gut. So um, whenever he receives a large amount of visceral blood flow due to eating a meal, um, he's unable to tolerate all the blood that the gut needs to digest, and then it feels the pain of the ischemia. Now we've got volvulus and Ogilvy syndrome. So a 57-year-old man who's post-op day six of an emergent laparotomy for a blunt abdominal trauma has increasing abdominal pain and obstipation. He's been requiring frequent dosing of his morphine PCA pump, and on exam, his abdomen is tender, distended, and bowel sounds are hypoactive. So this is a classic Ogilvy syndrome. So this is going to be post-op abdominal ileus, and there's a lot of risk factors here for having ileus. It's post-op of a laparoscopic surgery involving a large amount of trauma and probably blood within his peritoneum. And then he's been frequent dosing of his morphine pump, and he's probably been unable to ambulate, which is another risk factor. So treat by lowering the amount of narcotics, correcting any electrolyte abnormalities if they're present, especially hyperkalemia. And then if needed, there can be decompressions. Um, so you can try an NG tube versus an enema versus a rectal tube, depending on the size of the colon on x-ray. Lastly, we've got a 62-year-old man who presents with acute colicky abdominal pain with increasing nausea and emesis. Exam shows a distended abdomen with absent bowel sounds in the lower quadrants. You can diagnose this with volvulus. Um, the next best step would be an x-ray. So you can look for the omega sign in the sigmoid and a coffee bean sign in a sequel volvulus. The treatment is sigmoidoscopy decompression, or you can do a surgical resection. Getting into colon cancers now, we've got a 67-year-old woman who presents for decreasing stool caliber, or pencil stools, and fatigue for several months. She's lost 8 kilograms since her annual visit, and she has no family history of colon cancer. On rectal exam, fecal occult blood is positive, and then CBC shows a normal cytic anemia. Anyone who's over the age of 50 who needs a colonoscopy should have one immediately if they're having fecal occult positive blood. So the next best step is colonoscopy. And if you had found a colon cancer, you would want to do a staging CT, uh, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And you can use a CEA for monitoring of disease progress, not for screening. Uh, colon cancer is usually met by local extension. So look at regional lymphatics and a hematogenous in the portal system and the liver especially. Screening the U.S. Preventative Task Force recommends 45 to 75 years old now. Um, with colonoscopy every 10 years. You can do flexig every five years or a CT cholangiograph every five years. Fecal immunohistochemic retest yearly or a DNA stool test every three years. So a fecal occult blood test um, every year or cologuard every three years. There are certain hereditary colon cancers. A lot of the risk factors for sporadic colon cancers are age, diet, UC, and a family history. Screening starts at 40 or 10 years before the family member was diagnosed, if you have a family history. For familial syndromes, you have FAP, familial adipolyposis. It's autosomal dominant condition that leads to hundreds of polyps and eventual colon cancer. You can treat this with a prophylactic colectomy at age 18. There's also Gardner syndrome, which is a variant of FAP, and they often have osteomas and soft tissue masses. And then there's Turcot's syndrome. It's just a variant with glioblastomas or medulloblastomas. So Pugier's disease is an autosomal dominant condition that presents with multiple GI hamartomas. And it's classically called um, the pigmented lesions on the lips is what to look for. Um, so look for this in somebody with intussusception, um, GI upset, or you do an endoscopy and they've got small bowel hamartomas. There's an increased risk of non-colonic um, 
um, cancers in Turcos or in Peutz-Jeghers disease. So look at ovarian cancer, breast cancer, um, stomach cancer, small bowel cancer, etc. So lastly, there's hereditary non-polyposis or Lynch syndrome. There's an increased risk of colon as well as a variety of other cancers. So once again, ovarian and breast. Now coming to the GI bleeders. So you get a call in from EMS that they're in route with a 74 year old man who has a massive GI bleed. Your next best step is to insert two large bore IVs, type and cross, do an H and H and to give him fluids. So you want to determine if it's upper GI bleeding, mainly by hematemesis or coffee ground emesis, melana or frank hematochesia versus a lower GI bleed, which is just hematochesia. If he arrives with a shirt drenched in bright red blood, and you think this is an upper GI bleed, vital signs show a BP of 84 over palp and a pulse of 136. So you can try an EGD. It can be diagnostic and therapeutic of upper GI bleeds. And you can do colonoscopy or arteriogram for any lower GI bleeds if they were to come in. So upper GI bleed causes are PUDs. Um, they can erode and they can actually hit the splenic artery. Um, esophageal varices, Mallory Weiss tears, gastric ulcers, Dulafloy's lesions, which are there's submucosal arteries that kind of course through the stomach. And then you've got a Meckel's diverticulum or an arterioenteric fistula. Lower GI bleeds can be caused by diverticulosis, angiodysplasias like Oster Weber Wendu syndrome, IBD, colorectal cancers, or ischemic colitis. So moving on to some abdominal x-rays, if you've got a normal KUB, um, here's an overlay where a lot of the organs kind of sit. Next up we've got a perforation, so you can see the flu or the free air under the diaphragm. Then there's a Borhoff syndrome, so you can see the extravasation of the water-soluble contrast that should all be within the esophagus and it's out within the anterior mediastinum. Next up there's a small bowel obstruction, you can see dilated loops of small bowel with air fluid levels. Next, there's Crohn's disease, the classic string sign, and then ulcerative colitis, the lead pipe, or the loss of those haustra. Next, we've got a toxic megacolon, so greater than 10 centimeters dilation of the colon um, with inflammation is going to be risk of perforation. And then Ogilvy syndrome, where you're going to have a large dilation of the sigmoid colon, usually post-op. Now we've got a sequel volvulus, or the coffee bean sign, compared to the sigmoid volvulus, or the omega sign. So if you look at the angle, the sequel volvulus is sort of up towards the right upper quadrant, and the sigmoid volvulus is straight up and down. Next, we're going to get into biliary diseases or liver diseases. So the learning objectives here are to evaluate the patient with asymptomatic LFT elevations to determine the cause and management of liver failure, the breakdown of various hepatic viruses and how they differ, to describe the causes and complications of liver cirrhosis, to differentiate the identity of liver tumors and cysts using histo historical factors, and to discriminate the causes of gallbladder disease by history and imaging, explain the causes of acute and chronic pancreatic diseases, and identify common biliary pathologies on radiography. So these will be CTs. So asymptomatic liver damage. So we can see a 71-year-old woman presenting to her primary care physician for routine screening. She has a history of hypertension that's well controlled, and she drinks a couple of martinis a day. A screening CMP shows an elevated AST to ALT, and there's a ratio of 2 to 1. So alcoholic liver disease is classically 2 to 1, with the AST being elevated higher. Um, there are certain fun plays on this, like toast, um, raise your glass, so the AST is higher than the ALT. It's the most commonly cause of cirrhosis, with 20% heavy drinkers going on to develop it and you want to treat this with cessation of alcohol. A 53-year-old man presents to the primary care office for routine screening. He has a history of obesity and metabolic syndrome. He drinks one to two beers per week and he does not smoke. A screening CMP shows mild AST and ALT elevation, so what gives with this person if he's not drinking? So this is going to be non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH, and it's going to be the leading cause of AST ALT elevations in the US and 15% can go on to develop cirrhosis. So you want to treat this with weight loss if possible. Next we've got a 45 year old veteran who has a history of PTSD and bipolar disorder and he presents for routine screening. He takes trazodone for sleep and chlorpromazine for mood stability. 
So the diagnosis here, if he had an elevated LFTs, would be medication-induced transaminitis. Next step is to check for any herbal supplements or any polypharmacy, things that we can change around here. So now Wilson's disease. We've got a 23-year-old with increasing tremors, rigidity in chorea. His mother states that his personality has changed starkly in the past six months. He denies any alcohol or illicit drug use. On exam, there's shifting dullness appreciated within the abdomen. And then the labs show an elevated AST and ALT. So if you're thinking Wilson's disease, the next best step is a seroplasmin level. And you can confirm this with a liver biopsy and you can stain for copper. It's an autosomal recessive condition with a defect in the ATP7B gene. It leads to impaired copper metabolism. So there's excess opera, copper accumulates within the liver, the eyes, which are the classic Kaiser Flesher rings, the brain and the kidney, causing all of these symptoms here. So he can be treated with copper chelating agents like D-penicillamine and zinc supplementation. And then a liver transplant would be the definitive treatment for this. Now we've got hemochromatosis or iron overload syndrome. We've got a 51 year old man who comes in to discuss symptoms of fatigue and impotence. He has a history of type two diabetes and arthritis. On exam, his skin appears very tan and a fluid wave is in the abdomen. Hypogonadism is appreciated. So the next best step here would be iron studies. So you wanna look at iron, transferrin and ferritin and all of these should be elevated. You can do a liver biopsy or now genetic testing is often used for confirmation. So um, iron can deposit anywhere um, within the body. So the history of diabetes is from iron deposits within the pancreatic islet cells. Arthritis is iron deposits within the joints. Iron depositing within the skin gives him a tan or bronzed appearing. And then the fluid wave is due to iron depositing within the liver. So the hemosiderin deposits in all these major organs cause the cirrhosis, diabetes, tan, cardiomyopathy, monoarticular arthritis, um, and then impotence and hypothyroidism. Treatment would be regular phlebotomy to reduce the excess iron. And a lot of the times your female patients will be asymptomatic until following menopause because they do have regular phlebotomy. In terms of liver zebras to think about, if there's a 35 year old man with shortness of breath and recurrent cough for three months, he has a four pack year smoking history in college, but he quit. And then on exam, he's got diffuse wheezing, heard in all lung fields, and a liver edge is palpated. Labs show an elevated AST and ALT. So anyone with a COPD picture, especially early COPD, family history of COPD, and COPD with any type of liver elevations, you want to think of alpha-1 antitrypsin disease. Next step would be an alpha-1 antitrypsin level. And you can treat with alpha-1 antitrypsin infusions and treatment of the COPD with bronchodilators and vaccines. The definitive treatment is going to be a liver and lug transplantation by the time they're having these symptoms. Next, we've got a 41-year-old woman who presents with increasing fatigue and muscle aches. She's lost 10 kilograms since her last visit. She's not traveled or been exposed to blood products. On exam, she has scleral icterus, as she's tender to palpation in the right upper quadrant. Labs show wildly elevated AST and ALT. So this seems like a hepatitis picture, except she doesn't have any other risk factors for gaining a hepatitis virus. So the diagnosis here is autoimmune hepatitis. The next step is an anti-smooth muscle antibody screen and liver biopsy is confirmatory. The only treatment here is liver transplantation. So here are the hepatitides A through E. So we'll go through kind of a, a case by case scenario of how you would acquire each of these. So we've got a 34 year old cook in Tampa, Florida who presents with nausea, vomiting and jaundice six weeks after he returned from Haiti. So the diagnosis here would be um, hepatitis A virus infection. It's transmitted from unclean water sources and certain types of food, especially raw shellfish, increase your risk. So prevalent, um, you can prevent this with hand washing and a vaccine series, and it can be screened with LFTs. You wanna confirm with a hep A IgM acutely, and this can cause fulminant hepatic failure, um, especially in those that have hep B, hep C, um, or others. So now we've got a 45 year old businessman who presents with fever, malaise, and jaundice. He travels a lot for work, including Southeast Asia, which apparently is a hint on the MBMEs for um, has promiscuous sex. So the diagnosis here is acute hep B. You wanna screen with serologies and 10 to 15% of your acute hep B cases will go on to be chronic carriers. You can get passive immunization and you can prevent with hep B vaccine series. 
So now we've got a 49-year-old veteran who presents in the ED with a lethargic state. He's been homeless for the following five years, exchanging sex for IV drugs. On exam, a fluid wave and asterisk is seen. So you can diagnose this as chronic hep B and hep D superinfection. So hepatitis D requires the surface antigen for replication from hepatitis B, and there's a risk of fulminant hepatic failure, and it increases with co-infection if you get both of these at the same time. Now we've got a 67-year-old man who's found with mild LFT elevations on screening. He was involved in a car accident when he was young that required a transfusion, and he got a tattoo from a friend at college, or you can consider this a tattoo during World War II. He was in great shape. He takes no medication and denies drinking alcohol. So this is a chronic hep C infection. The next best step is screening with a hep C serology and confirm with a viral load PCR. So now it's recommended that anybody in the baby boomer generation is screened one time. And you can treat this with a combination protease inhibitors and antivirals. So there's quite a few different treatment options on the market. They can be extremely expensive, but it's now sponsored through the VA and a lot of insurances because it's a cure for hep C. So now we've got a 27-year-old pregnant woman who returns from a trip to India with jaundice, right upper quadrant pain, and dark colored urine. Diagnosis here would be a hep E infection. It's a mild disease, very similar to hep A, although there's a 20% mortality among pregnant mothers due to the risk of fulminant hepatitis. So this is very important to counsel any pregnant patients before they travel abroad, mainly Africa and India, where this is more common. So now moving into cirrhosis and ascites. So there's a 58-year-old man who presents with complaints of increased abdominal girth, new rash, and, quote, man boobs. He has a history of hep B, and he drinks 1.5 bottles of vodka per day. On exam, the abdomen is distended with shifting dullness, and there are multiple tortuous veins, or spider angiomas, his palms are very red with palmar erythema, and he has gynecomastia. There are bruises of varying ages on his extremities. The next best step here would be abdominal ultrasound and then a paracentesis to look at the fluid. So you can do a serum albumin ascites gradient. So if the serum albumin um, subtracted from the ascites is greater than 1.1, um, you want to look at portal hypertension being the cause. So think cirrhosis, heart failure, or Bud Carey syndrome. If it is less than 1.1, so there's not as much of a gap between the albumin, think things like tuberculosis, cancer, pancreatitis, and infections causing this ascites. Some of the complications include portal hypertension, esophageal varices, SBP, hepatic encephalopathy, hepatorenal syndrome, coagulopathies, and hepatocellular carcinoma from long-term cirrhosis and ascites. The treatment would be to remove any hepatotoxic insults like alcohol or Tylenol, and to treat any reversible causes like hepatitis C, hemochromatosis, or Wilson's disease. The definitive treatment is a liver transplantation, and it requires six months of alcohol sobriety to be added to the wait list. So some of the cirrhosis complications. So say we've got this 58-year-old man with a history of um, hep B and alcoholism with class C child puig liver failure. He comes into the ED with a large volume hematemesis and coffee ground emesis. So these are classically esophageal varices. The next best step would be to do your ABCs and to refer back to the GI bleeder section um, a few minutes ago. Um, and to do an EGD is the next best step. So the treatment would be EGD, ligation, banding, or sclerotherapy to try and stop the bleeding. You can do IV octeotride to lower the bleeding amount. And you can do non-selective beta blockers for prevention. You can also do octeotride per for prevention. And you can do a TIPS procedure to relieve the portal hypertension, which is often the cause of these varices. So if he came in with fever and altered mental status, on exam he has tenderness to palpation in the epigastrium and he has a fluid wave. So this would be SBP or spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. The next best step is paracentesis and sending a gram stain for culture. And the treatment here is antibiotics, usually a broad spectrum cephalosporin to cover gram negative enteric organisms. The thought is that they extravasate from the GI tract and they get into the peritoneum. And then he needs lifetime prevention with ciprofloxacin after this to prevent a secondary recurrence of SBP. If he came in with altered mental status and lethargy, on exam he had a flapping tremor or asterixis. The diagnosis would be hepatic encephalopathy. This is a clinical diagnosis. There's no serum ammonia levels needed 
um, although you can order serum ammonia levels, there are also worksheets that you can do. The treatment would be lactulose. It prevents ammonia absorption. And then you can also do rifamixin, which kills bacterial flora, which are often the producers of ammonia. And then to go on a lower protein diet. So if he came in with oliguria and hypotension, this is a hepatorenal syndrome. It's caused by systemic vasoconstriction and diuretics. And you want to treat this, and it's a difficult dance between fluids and systemic vasoconstriction. The idea is you want to constrict usually the enteric um, blood flow, and you want to increase flow to the kidneys, and it's a very hard balance to achieve. Liver transplant is often the cure for this. So moving into hepatocellular carcinoma, we've got a 65-year-old Asian man who presents with a 15-kilogram weight loss and fatigue for six months. He has a history of hep B, leading to cirrhosis, and he also has schistosomiasis. On exam, there's tenderness in the right upper quadrant, and a lumpy liver edge can be palpated. The next best step here would be a triphasic CT with, quote, arterial enhancement and early washout. Um, and you can try ultrasound as a screening method as well. Biopsy is the definitive diagnosis, and you can use AFP levels to track the progression of this. The risk factors for HCC are cirrhosis, hepatitis, any alpha toxins, even schistosomiasis infections, and vinyl chlorides. And it causes a perineoplastic syndrome like erythrocytosis and thrombocytosis. And the treatment is going to be resection if you're able to do it or a taste procedure, a transcatheter arterial chemoembolization. So some other liver tumors and cysts. So if you have a 23-year-old woman undergoing a right upper quadrant ultrasound for biliary colic, and there is a large, well-demarcated hypoechoic liver lesion is identified, this is going to be a hepatic adenoma. There is risk of rupture with massive hemoperitoneum here. So surgical resection is needed if they're larger than 5 centimeters or if they don't regress with the cessation of oral contraceptive pills. So they grow with the estrogen amounts. So next we've got a 34 year old undergoing a CT scan for possible PE when a liver lesion with a central scar is incidentally noted. So the central scar is pathognomonic for focal nodular hyperplasia and no treatment is needed here. So a 48 year old immigrant dog trainer and sheep herder from Argentina presents for right upper quadrant pain a right upper quadrant ultrasound shows multiple liver cysts. So the diagnosis here is hydatid cyst disease. It's due to a tapeworm or a kinococcus, and it's treated with surgical resection and mebendazole. Any ruptured cyst will cause a anaphylactic shock-like syndrome. And then you can get this from sheep and sheep herding dogs, usually in South America. Lastly, we've got a 30-year-old MSM man who presents with one week of bloody diarrhea and emesis. On exam, there is fever and tenderness in the right upper quadrant. So this can be an amoebic liver abscess from Emptamoeba histolytica. You can screen with a stool O&P or serology, and you want to treat with mebendazole or paramycin. Or, next, we've got acute liver failure with a 54-year-old with or membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis who presents with increasing abdominal girth and pain. On exam, there's a fluid wave and the liver is markedly tender. Labs show elevated serum transaminases, bilirubin, and a prolonged PT. So this is a Bud Chiari syndrome. It's a rapidly progressing hepatic failure. You can diagnose it with angiography to see the clot within the portal system. Treatment is thrombolytics or balloon angioplasty and portal cable shunt. So the most common causes are hypercoagulable states like a nephrotic syndrome because they lose antithrombin 3 or paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, um, PNH or myeloproliferative disorders, pregnancy, and rheumatologic diseases. Next, we've got a 30-year-old man who's brought into the ED from a park in a stupor estate. He's got nausea, protracted vomiting, jaundice, and malaise. On exam, there's noticeable icterus and asterixis. Labs show LFTs in the 10,000 range. The diagnosis here would be acetaminophen toxicity. The treatment is N-acetylcysteine to replete the hepatic glucothione levels and supportive care and management of the fulminant hepatic failure. Liver transplant can be considered as well. So now somebody with jaundice. So we've got a 27 year old African American who presents following treatment for a UTI and he's got yellow eyes. The common thing here is G6PD deficiency. It's a hemolytic anemia caused by oxidative stress on the red blood cells. 
So um, even fava beans, a lot of your sulfa antibiotics can cause um, an increased hemolytic anemia. So you wanna watch out for this when you're treating patients. Next, there's an 18-year-old who's post-op day two from an internal fixation from an MBA and he develops yellowing skin. So this is Gilbert syndrome. It's a relative deficiency of UDGP transferase. And this is basically exacerbated by stressful events like fasting, fevers, stress, illnesses, um, and this is completely benign. The next step for both of these would be to look at unconjugated bilirubin. Unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, um, the most common causes are gallbladder disease, dupin johnson syndrome, Rotor syndrome, PBC, and PSC. And then if there is conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, the differential here is hemolytic anemia, Gilbert syndrome, creekler najjar drugs or liver disease. So some of these funny named ones will be going over in the pediatric section. Next up, cholelithiasis and cholecystitis. So we've got a 43-year-old indigenous American who, woman who presents with intermittent abdominal pain after eating. The pain is burning feeling in the right upper quadrant and mid-back, which is Boaz sign, and it's worsened with fatty meals. She has a history of three cesarean sections and diabetes. The diagnosis here would be biliary colic. And the next best step for any type of pain in the right upper quadrant is right upper quadrant ultrasound. You want to treat with elective cholecystectomy, or you can try ursodiol. Um, the risk factors here are obesity, pregnancy, OCPs, Crohn's disease, or cystic fibrosis. And then specifically, pigmented stones can be caused by bilirubin buildup. So there's an increased risk in those with hereditary spherocytosis, sickle cell disease, or any of the thalassemias. Three weeks later, the same patient comes into the ED with nausea, emesis, and persistent pain. There's also a fever on exam. She calls out in pain when inspiring and palpating under the right upper, or right upper quadrant costal margin. So this is Murphy's sign. The diagnosis here is cholecystitis. The next best step would be right upper quadrant ultrasound, or you can try a CT scan. Treatment is IV fluids, antibiotics, and NPO, and you want to prepare for a cholecystectomy. Some complications include perforations, gallstone ileus, which is where the gallstone will eventually make its way down into the terminal ileum and cause an ileus, gangrenous cholecystitis, and acalous cholecystitis, which are more common in the elderly and those with diabetes. So next up, we've got cholelithiasis and cholangitis. So we've got a 55-year-old man with nonspecific right upper quadrant pain for the past month. On exam, he appears jaundiced, and he has pain to palpation in the right upper quadrant. Lab show an elevated ALK FOS and direct bilirubin, so a cholestatic picture. And right upper quadrant ultrasound shows a dilated common bile duct. So this is cholelithiasis. And the next best step here would be an ERCP, which is stone extraction and stent placement. It's both diagnostic and therapeutic. Some of the complications could be progression to cholangitis, gallstone ileus, or pancreatitis from this. So next we've got a 49-year-old with right upper quadrant pain and fever. He seems to trail off on history and he's unable to answer questions. Vital signs are hypotensive with a tachycardia and elevated temperature. On exam, he's jaundiced with scleral icterus. The diagnosis here would be cholangitis, and the next best step is IV fluids, blood cultures, and antibiotics, and you want to stabilize the patient before you can treat them with ERCP, PTC, or laparotomy once the patient's stable with 48 hours of antibiotics. So classically, this is Charcot's triad with right upper quadrant pain, jaundice, and fever, or Reynolds' pentad with right upper quadrant pain, jaundice, fever, altered mental status, and signs of septic shock. So now moving into PSC and PBC. So we've got a 57-year-old who presents with increasing pruritus. He has a long history of UC for which he's on immunosuppressive treatment, and he's lost eight kilograms since last year. On exam, there is scleral icterus present, and a liver edge is palpated. Labs show a cholestatic picture with elevated LFTs and a P anca. So this is primary sclerosing cholangitis, PSC. This is both intra and extra hepatic duct narrowing, and it leads to cholestasis and liver failure. The imaging of choice is an ERCP, and you can treat this with cholestyramine for the symptoms and then an urgent liver transplant. So a 46-year-old woman with a history of eczema and Graves' disease presents with months of palmar pruritus. On exam, there's mild tenderness in the right upper quadrant, and lab studies show a transaminitis with a positive antimitochondrial antibody.
So this is primary biliary sclerosis. This is just intrahepatic duct destruction, and it's a classic beads on a string pattern with ERCP. You can treat this with cholestyramine and ursodiol, and it also needs a liver transplant. And the antibody of interest here is anti-mitochondrial antibody. So now cholangiocarcinoma. This is a 70-year-old woman with a change in her stool. She states they're clay-colored, and her urine has been very dark. On exam, she appears cachectic, and there's considerable jaundice, and labs show a cholestatic pattern. The next best step would be to do an ERCP to determine diagnosis and resectability. So this is a Klatskin's tumor, which is proximal um, common bile duct, and it's unresectable. Some of the risk factors are PSC, cholidocal cyst, and clonarchus infection, which is Chinese tapeworm. The treatment would be symptomatic relief with biliary stenting and drainage. Resection is possible depending on the location, but the prognosis for any cholangiocarcinoma is very poor. Moving on to the pancreas with an acute pancreatitis. So we've got a 36-year-old man who presents with excruciating abdominal pain that radiates to his back. He's nauseous with multiple episodes of emesis. Vital signs show hypotensive with tachycardia and an elevated temperature. On exam, his abdomen is distended and tender with decreased bowel sounds and there's no skin changes seen. The next best step here would be a serum lipase, which is more specific than a uh, amylase. And you wanna order glucose, calcium, hematocrit, BUN, do an ABG, um, an LDH, AST, and white blood cell count. And these are all needed for Ranson's criteria, which is gonna be a prognostic indicator. The best imaging choice for looking at pancreatitis is a CT scan, and you can also identify the complications, which we'll go over next. The most common causes of this are alcohol, gallstones, ERCPs, or iatrogenic injuries, viral diseases like mumps, drugs, scorpion bites, specifically in Trinidad and Tobago, trauma, pancreas divisum, or it's a genetic defect where they're split pancreas, hypertriglyceridemia, usually with levels over 1,000. Um, you're going to treat this with being NPO with IV fluids. You can do ICU monitoring for complications and NJ tube for trickle feeds if it's very severe. You want to treat the pain with a non-sphincter of OD agent, so don't use morphine. And some of the complications to look out for, say we've got a 36-year-old from the last slide and 40% area of hypoattenuation with gas, so this would be a necrotizing pancreatitis. You would need to do IV antibiotics, um, for instance, imipenem and a CT-guided percutaneous aspiration and gram stain to determine if it's sterile or infected. Next, if there was a 45-year-old binge drinker who had abdominal pain and hypotension, there's ecchymoses seen in the periumbilical area, or colon sign, and on his flank, Gray-Turner sign, and near the inguinal ligament, which is Fox sign. So this is diagnostic of a hemorrhagic pancreatitis, and you would like to do a CT scan with contrast to look for that. The next day, he developed increasing shortness of breath requiring intubation. Chest x-ray shows diffuse areas of haziness or a lung whiteout. So this would be acute respiratory distress syndrome. We went over this in the um, pulmonary section. You want to treat the underlying inflammation and turn up the PEEP. Three weeks later, the patient is due to be discharged when he develops decreasing tolerance to food with nausea and emesis. Another CT scan shows a 5 centimeter homogeneous mass with a single um, lining in the pancreas, pressing on the gastroduodenal junction. The diagnosis here is a pancreatic pseudocyst. The next step is draining it percutaneously or surgically, and you want to do this if it's five centimeters or larger because the risk of infection, rupture, and mass effect are larger. So now chronic pancreatitis. A 63-year-old presents with recurrent severe bouts of abdominal pain that radiate to the back. He's also noticed his stools are large, foul and they float and he used to drink one handle of rum per day but he's recently joined AA and quit. On exam he appears cachectic and disheveled. The next best step here would be a CT of the abdomen showing pancreatic calcifications. The most common cause here is alcohol abuse chronically. Um, cystic fibrosis and autoimmune pancreatitis from IgG3 are also possible. The treatment would be frequent, small, low-fat meals, and you want to try PERT therapy or pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. H2 blockers and insulin are used for the secondary diabetes that can develop.
So pancreatic cancer. We've got a 60-year-old African-American man who presents with vague complaints of fatigue, depression, and abdominal pain. He has a 50-pack year smoking history, and he drinks three to four beers per day. On exam, there's scleral icterus and a palpable abdominal mass in the epigastrium. And the next best step here would be a CT scan for the diagnosis. You can do ERCP for biopsy when it's in the head of the pancreas. And then calcium 19.9 or CA 19.9 is going to be used to monitor for surveillance. The presentation differs depending on location, the head versus the tail. So the head area can present earlier with a cholestatic picture and the tail usually presents late and it can have a perineoplastic syndrome of depression. You wanna watch for migratory thrombophlebitis, which is Trousseau syndrome, so they can have clots anywhere in the body. And you wanna treat with surgical resection in the head of the pancreas with a Whipple's procedure or a stent placement and palliative care. So now going into the abdominal scans, the first picture we have here is a large hepatic cyst, so a single lining, it's uniform in color. Next, we've got hepatocellular carcinoma, so the liver is nodular and there's a large fungating mass. Now we've got a right upper quadrant ultrasound of cholecystitis, so you can see the stones in that area. And then we have an x-ray of gallstone ileus, so you can see the air within the biliary tree in the right upper quadrant in the liver. You can see the stone in the right lower quadrant, and you can see the air fluid levels and dilations from the ileus. Now we've got an acute pancreatitis here. So the pancreas is not very uniform looking, it looks red and angry. And then our pancreatic pseudocyst, or a very large single lining cyst um, in the pancreas, usually in the head. Now we've got a chronic pancreatitis, so all the white calcifications in the center, and pancreatic cancer, a large fungating mass within the center. So that's it for the GI and biliary sections. Tune in next time, we'll do endocrinology and hemonc. I am Professor Patrick. Yes, sir. Dr. Professor Patrick.